Okay, guys, here's your video lecture for chapters uh, 8 through 10 in your textbook. I'm um, getting a lot of good questions, so keep those coming. I um, want to dive right in here because I've got several I want to, to handle. Um, first, I want to say there were some questions that have led me to think that um, we might need a little brush up on just basic things like world population and time frames. Um, I've posted, I put a video down below this lecture, um, you know, kind of shows how uh, population has exploded recently. And, uh, uh, you know, in the past, there weren't that many people on the planet. Um, and so take a look at that and kind of hopefully give you some perspective on that question. Um, one of the questions is, what were church services like then in comparison to now? And that's a, that's a neat question. Um, um, it depends. Okay, um, the you know we don't know a great deal about the basics of the early Christian worship because Christianity was a very small sect for a long time. Well, not a long time, but for a significant amount of time. You know, Christianity begins with um, the twelve apostles and gradually spreads and, and grows until it it takes over you know, the Roman Empire. But that took some time. And so the Christians uh, that were meeting earlier, in the early part of the first century, um, they were mostly meeting in houses, um, occasionally in a synagogue. Uh, but the church was very much uh, a kind of fly by the seat of your pants sort of thing. People were meeting wherever they could. Now, the church did have an organized leadership, which is... Um, one of the things that made them so powerful um, as they gained in numbers, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, a little later in this lecture with another question, but um, all we really know about the very earliest uh, worships, worship services, church meetings, whatever you want to call them, um, comes from the New Testament. And um, basically, I want to read this to you. This is a uh, uh, one of the things that Paul says, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and giving thanks, broke and said, Take ye and eat. This is my body, which shall be delivered for you. Do this for the commemoration of me. In like manner also the chalice, after he had supped, saying, This chalice is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as you shall drink, for the commemoration of me. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink the chalice, you show the death of the Lord until he comes. So that is a very brief description of the celebration of the Eucharist, the, the Lord's Supper. And so we know that that was something that the very earliest Christians were doing. Um, I spent a lot of time as a missionary in other parts of the world, um, specifically back behind the Iron Curtain, back when communism was ruling that part of the world, and Christianity was outlawed. And so I have some experience in uh, knowing what it's like to be in an underground church, to be in a church that is uh, being persecuted and cannot meet openly, which is what it was like for Christians for a long time in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire saw the Christians as a, as a threat to everything they stood for. And the more power the Christians gained, the more people became followers of Jesus, uh, the more threatened the empire became. And there were several really brutal persecutions of the emperor in the empire against the Christians. Um, but when this happens, like I said, I've, I've, I've gotten a small little minor taste of that. Um, Christianity tends to do great. Um, we met in houses. We let, met in abandoned factories. We, you know, did all kinds of crazy stuff to try to evade the, the uh, authorities. And um, to tell you the truth, it was quite a bit of fun, um, you know, out there on the ragged edge of being an outlaw just for a very different kind of cause. And uh, this was one of the great, great times of my life. Um, but what I want to say is that where you have that situation happen, people get together, right? They will read the Bible. They will have some teaching about the Bible. They will sing some hymns and some worship songs. And many of the songs that were sung in these underground churches in Eastern Europe were the same songs that people were singing around here at Falls Creek. You know, so the, the, this, this stuff sends a kind of spread throughout um, the Christian population. And, um, you know, that's going, that's what church is. And then, of course, there's the Lord's Supper, the, the, the body and, and the blood, the bread and the wine. 
And that is all we really know about the early Christian church services. Now, I do, we do know that as early as Augustine, who's writing, he writes at the very, um, kind of the really the crunch time for the fall of the western part of the empire in the uh, fourth century. Um, he talks about the sacrifice of the altar, and he talks about having priests, right? Um, so uh, many aspects of what we think of as, as Catholicism, which I am, you know, full disclosure, I'm Roman Catholic, um, many of those elements are there in the very earliest um, Christian expressions from back from the very early parts of, the, of Christian history. But when you get to, you know, what were the very first Christians doing, um, we don't know, but we can guess. And I'm willing to bet, I would bet anything, that it's very much like what was happening in the underground churches where I was at in the you know, last part of the 20th century. Um, um, the book says there, are, this is a question, the book says there are no official accounts of Jesus' death. With the belief that it was true, why would there not be official records? Now that's an interesting question. One of the things that skeptics um, say is that, uh, and they point out rightly, that there are no really contemporary historians that reference um, Jesus. Um, you know, now we do have, of course, the New Testament. You know, we've got these eyewitness accounts of what happened. Those count. Um, it, it bothers me sometimes when scholars say, there's no record of this. Well, there are records. We've had them for a very long time. It's called the Gospels. Um, but what they mean is there's no there's no cor corroborating information from other scholars or other historians of that era um, who were secular, who weren't part of the Christian community. And there's a number of reasons for that, I think. Um, one is the church was very small for a while. Uh, this thing happened in a tiny corner of the Roman Empire. Uh, Jerusalem had been conquered by the Romans. Jesus, as far as the Romans were concerned, as far as anybody outside of the disciples and the immediate people around Jesus, he was just another revolutionary. And they were killing those people like flies. Um, the Romans were executing revolutionaries all the time. And nothing came of any of those. Um, there was a great deal of unrest um, and a great deal of popular anger against the Roman Empire amongst the Jewish people. The Jewish people were very proud. They had at once had their own kingdom, right? the glorious kingdom of, of, of uh, David and Solomon. And they had been through some rough times. And they saw the Roman occupation as another one of these kinds of, you know, besmirching the, the glory of the Jewish people and the, and the kingdom of Israel. And so in Israel's past, there have been several military leaders who rose up and, and you know, smote the enemies of Israel, right? Um, the Maccabees, uh, the, the, the name Maccabees means the hammer of God. It was one of their great, you know, warrior kings of, the, of, of Jewish history. And they were expecting this to happen again. They were really expecting someone to come along like Maccabees and kick the Romans the heck out. Um, and lots of people were thinking it might be them, right? They were gathering people and we're going to bring back you know, the glory of Israel. And God is on our side. And the Romans would just stomp on them. And as far as anybody knew, that was what Jesus was. Um, the trial of Jesus is an interesting thing to me. There's some aspects of it I, I think that aren't really um, talked about much. Pontius Pilate, the person, the Roman ruler of, of Jerusalem wants to let him go. And the only way the crowd and the Sanhedrin can get them to condemn him is by saying he set himself up as a king. And anyone who does that is not a friend to Caesar. And this was kind of a veiled threat against Pilate himself. Basically what they were saying was that if Pilate lets Jesus go, they're going to report back to the emperor that Pilate sided with a revolutionary. And so Pilate did not think Jesus needed to be condemned on his own merits, you know, anything that he could find he's done wrong. Pilate kept bringing him out to the crowd. I find nothing wrong with this man, right? Uh, and so finally they pushed Pilate into a corner where they said, we're going to say you were on the side with a revolutionary. Because remember, these things are happening all over the place, especially in Judea, especially in the province of Rome that Jerusalem was in. And so... Uh, Pilate ended up in a situation where he was, he felt forced to do this. Um, 
And so because this was a common occurrence, and because Christianity begins this, this little tiny, you know, kernel of people, really, the, 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 the disciples hiding out in, in, in a rented house um, after the crucifixion, that's it. That's, that's the church, 12 people and, and a few hangers on, you know, that's it. Um, and so this kind of thing, it went by unnoticed. And a great deal of early Christian history is, is kind of like that. And what's amazing is how Christianity went from that very, very um, small and seemingly insignificant beginning to taking over the whole Roman Empire within about 400 years. Uh, it's astonishing. Um, and so my answer to this is a long answer. Is that one of the reasons you don't find contemporary scholars or contemporary historians referencing this um, is because it wasn't noteworthy at the time. It was just another little squabble amongst religious fanatics and something to do with a guy who said he was the king of the Jews. That's all anybody would have thought about it, and those people were a dime a dozen in that part of the world during that time. Um, the next question is, is the church still standing that was built around Jesus' tomb? If not, how would they even know where it was? Um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is in Jerusalem. You can go see it to this day. Um, the story is that when Constantine became Christian, um, he began to undo some of the damage that had been done by earlier emperors who had tried to, to persecute and snuff out Christianity. And one of the emperors, Hadrian, had actually built a, um, it was a temple to Venus over the cave where Jesus had been buried. And, and kind of the idea was, we're just going to cover this up with a pagan temple and therefore keep Christians from being able to, you know, venerate this place. And so uh, Constantine went in and he uh, took down the temple that was there and built a protecting building over the cave. Um, and that's what you see inside the church that's there now. So there's a protecting building, right? It's a building within a building within a building. You have the, the cave where he was buried. You have the building they put over that to protect it. And it's been damaged and, and earthquakes have happened and stuff. It's been repaired many times. But it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, it's a building within a building. And within that building is supposed to be the place where Jesus uh, was buried and arose from the dead. That's where that, that event happened. And so um, that's how that church gets to be there. And that's why it's still there. And they're still there. They're still taking care of it. Um, it's one of the big tourist attractions if you go to Jerusalem is the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, okay, this is another one that we that we got to straighten this out, right? Um, B.C. and A.D. are very confusing uh, because they mean different things and they don't mean what it sounds like they mean. And one of the one of them is in a different language, a dead language. So most people think that. B.C. means before Christ, and A.D. means after death, right? So that B.C. is before Christ arrives, and A.D. is after Jesus dies. And then there's 30 years of his life in the middle that just doesn't get counted. That is not the case. Um, A.D. is Latin uh, for, an, it's, the, it's the initials of Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. And so uh, in olden times, right, people would say, and you still sometimes in really special situations, you know, very formal, people say, the year of our Lord, 1967, right, the, that the year of our Lord part is Anno Domini, uh, Anno Domini. And so uh, that's Latin for after Jesus comes, the, 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 the year of the Lord, the, they start at zero when Jesus is born. And then... Um, uh, B.C. is English, and it's for before Christ. So you've got two languages and two different things. But basically it means that A A.D. is after the birth of Jesus, and uh, B.C. is before the birth of Christ. Uh, now, the problem with this is that um, the study of history is largely a secular thing, right? There's um, We can't assume, and we shouldn't assume, that everyone who deals with history is necessarily a Christian person or believes that Jesus is the Son of God or any of that other stuff, right? Um, uh, and so it, people have come up with a more, um, a less Christianized way of doing this. And that's BCE, which is before Common Era, and then CE is Common Era. But zero still chart starts at the birth of Christ. For B, BCE 
and CE. That's our zero because that's the way it's been for a very long time. And so uh, that's hopefully clears up the confusion between AD, uh, BC, BCE, and CE. Um, but once again, Google's your friend on this, right? You can you can Google this and figure this thing out. But it does get kind of confusing if you're used to one thing and you hear another and you're not really sure what it is. Um, another question was about courtly love. Courtly love is a fascinating thing. Um, it comes about in the Middle Ages. And uh, we still have echoes of it to this very day. Um, Let's, let, let me do this. Let, let's talk about the world and the relationship between men and women in terms of romance prior to Christianity. Um, it was pretty much a free for all. Uh, you know, we what, what what we know that the Roman um, family was not doing well. There was a lot of infidelity, a lot of of just very loose and chaotic and haphazard uh, anarchic. Uh, sexual mores, uh, things weren't do going well. Um, the Dark Ages come, right? When the, you were talking about the early ages after the fall of Rome. You've got a lot of mercenary folks around. You've got a lot of people who have training in combat and they have armor and they have swords. And as time goes by, you end up with this situation where you have the knights the trained soldiers who have armor and have weapons and everybody else. And for a very long time, um, an armored knight was nearly indestructible, invincible. Um, knights in battle were generally captured if they lost and held hostage because you could basically surround a knight and steal armor and beat on him with clubs for a while. <laughs> He's not going to feel it, right? The way to take down a, a knight was to exhaust him till he couldn't move anymore, and then everybody drag him off the battlefield and hold him captive, right? You actually had to get a knight's helmet off to deal a death blow, for the most part. Um, and so for that reason, uh, you end up with people who have tremendous power over other people, um, by the very nature of how strong they are. And the courtly love is kind of a, it's a Christianizing of that thing to some degree, that situation of overwhelming force. Um, in the Arthurian legends, right, um, there's the Black Knight, right? We kind of have this, this, this archetype of the Black Knight and the White Knight, right? The Good Knight and the Evil Knight. The Evil Knight has the Fair Maiden tied up, right? Nothing good's going to happen there. And the White Knight comes along and he fights the Black Knight and rescues her. Now, this story does not go the way that people think it does. Um, the ultimate white knight of, of the ancient, of the medieval world, right, the, the legends that grew up around Arthur and, 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 and his court, was Sir Gawain. Gawain was the best of Arthur's knights. Not the most powerful, not the most formidable in combat, but the best human being. Uh, Lancelot was the strongest knight. Gawain was the best. It's a great poem translated by J.R.R. Tolkien, the guy that wrote Lord of the Rings, called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. It will tell you what you need to know about courtly love. It's a strange story. Um, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll find a link to it. I'm sure it's on, online somewhere. This stuff can't be copyright, copyrighted, right? It's an ancient story. Um, but Gawain, he, if he beats the Black Knight, he doesn't take the maiden. Gawain was a, a dedicated virgin. He was a celibate man. And the Middle Ages, coming out of the Christianization of the world, really celebrated that, that, that idea that someone would um, do without that part of their lives in order to devote themselves to the service of God. Um, and so courtly love is the way that a person, a knight, right, takes the instinct towards um, capture and conquest that comes along with part of the you know, dance that sexuality is and tames that to some degree. The idea is the knight is devoted to the lady. Sir Gawain rescues the princess, right? But he cannot have her and will not. The better he is, the less he's interested in that. Right? He's going to take her and keep her safe, and that's that. Um, Gawain is not going to take the place of the, of the darkness. And, and we, we get this mixed up, right, in our, in our current 
parlance when people talk about white knighting, right? This is, I'm, I'm enough on the internet to know that there's this whole community out there of men who hate women. And anyone who comes to the defense of a woman is called a white knight. And the, the idea being that if you come to the defense of a woman who's being attacked online or anywhere else, you're only doing this because you have ulterior motives, because you, you want to sleep with her. Um, that is not courtly love, right? That's exactly the opposite of what Sir Gawain would be up to in that circumstance. Um, the ideal knight of that age, the idea, not the practice of it, because the practice of it gets really messy, right? <laughs> Relationships between men and women. But the idea was that a man should be able to devote himself to a woman with no ulterior motives at all and use the strength that he has to serve and protect. That is the idea. Uh, Lancelot has a chance at this in the Arthurian legends because he is he loves Queen Guinevere, King Arthur's wife, but he doesn't stay pure. He, he steps over that line and actually sleeps with her. And the whole uh, tragedy that ends King Arthur's reign is uh, it begins to unravel at that point because the most powerful knight that Arthur had violated that rule. Sir Gawain, on the other hand, had a picture of the Virgin Mary, her face, painted on the inside of his shield. So when he went into battle and raised his shield up, he could see the lady that he was devoted to. You cannot find a more untouchable woman, right, to devote your life to than the Virgin Mary. That's Sir Gawain. And so that's kind of what courtly love is. It's about taking these instincts of, of conquest and of, and of, of you know, the kinds of, of abuses that can happen between strength and weakness in relationships between men and women and um, making a Christian virtue out of that uh, instinct sublimating it to um, the service of Christ instead of the service of lust or, or whatever else. I feel like I've really not explained that well, but um, if you still have questions, sorry, we, uh, we can talk about some more. If you really want to know, read, read the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. It's a beautiful story. It's kind of a fairy tale about Sir Gawain and this challenge he's given. And part of the challenge is, will he, will he cross that line? Will he, will he sleep with another man's wife? Um, and he will not do it. That's just not who Sir Gawain is. Um, another question, it's said that very little of early Christian art survived to today. Why is that? We have art that survived from the cavemen. Why not early Christian art? And the answer is a great deal of that art did survive. Um, the cave art, we have the cave art because of accidents of history, mostly. We don't know how much of it there was. Now, once again, when you look at the population thing, right, look at the, the numbers of people on the planet when you're going back into prehistory, it's a very small number. The fact that we find these caves with cave paintings in them probably means that we're, they were painting all the time. They were probably painting a bunch because very few people on the planet, and yet we find these cave paintings. But when we find them, usually there's some kind of, of accident of geology. Um, the cave in France, the famous cave in France with the horses, picture of horses in it, it was covered by a landslide. So it was literally sealed off from the outside world, and that preserved the paintings for you know, thousands of years. Um, the art the Christians did in the early Christian era, when they were an underground church, was literally under the ground. The catacombs in Rome um, are an enormous network of burial chambers. And it is so expansive that you could lose yourself and die down there to this very day. Um, as of the last time I kind of researched this at all was several years ago, but, but the last time I did look at it, uh, they were saying that we still haven't mapped the things. We don't know how extensive they are. No one has fully mapped the catacombs of Rome. So think about how ancient a city Rome is, right? It's been there for a long, long time. And the way they buried their dead was they dug uh, tunnels in the ground beneath the city. And they would bury their dead there. And they just kept doing this for centuries. And so to this day, you can go down to the catacombs beneath Rome. And you can see all these little niches in the walls where dead bodies are. Um, uh, and so the Christian church, well, they went underground. They literally went under the ground. They went down into the catacombs. And 
that's where they had their churches. That's where they had their um, their meetings. It was a, a way of staying safe from the uh, Roman authorities, the people who were persecuting them, because nobody goes into a graveyard looking for these people. Um, and even if they did, the 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 catacombs were so such a maze and so extensive that that you could you could hide yourself down there. They could send people in there, and they can't find you. Um, and so what we do have of early Christian art comes from these areas in the catacombs. Um, you can find places where churches, where church was held. This is an area in the catacombs where they had church services. And there will be um, some remains of paintings and things like that on the walls. I'm going to put a few of those up there for you uh, uh, beneath this in the, in the supplementary stuff beneath the video lecture. Um, what's interesting is the, the fish symbol, right? You see that on the, on the back of people's cars, the fish, um, that means Jesus. It means Christianity. Uh, but what people don't generally realize is that was a secret symbol. Um, the fish was the symbol of Christianity and not the cross for a very long time. Because, first of all, anyone who had actually seen a crucifixion didn't want to be reminded of that. Right? It's a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, not until the last people who had actually seen someone crucified died out did the cross become um, the symbol of Christianity. Um, but the fish... There's all these references to fish in the New Testament, right? Peter is a fisherman. Uh, Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. Uh, there's a miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Uh, um, when Jesus reappears to the disciples by the, the, the lakeside, um, he, he cooks a meal of fish for them. Um, there, the fish, fish show up again and again. And the Christians adopted that symbol as kind of a secret sign to say, this is where Christians are. And so when you go through the catacombs, you can find little carvings of fish on the walls. And that would be a way to say to anyone wandering around down there, this is a safe house. This is where Christians can gather and be safe. Um, Christians meet, two people meeting, right? You, you meet somebody on the road. You meet somebody in, a, in, a, in, a, in just kind of a casual you know, encounter with someone. If you're a Christian, then you want to know if they're a Christian too. Because if they're not, they could, you know, <laughs> have you thrown into the arena, right? There, there, there were some terrible, terrible, per, terrible persecutions in the, that day and age, and still are in other parts of the world, by the way. To this very day, that kind of thing is happening. Um, but one of the things they would do is, if you met somebody on the road and you're like, oh, I don't know if this is a Christian or not, you could draw uh, draw the shape of a fish in the dirt just casually, and the person, if they were a Christian, would know to look for that. And then if they drew a picture of a fish as well, then you knew that you were in you were in safe company. You could discuss your faith with this person. Uh, but that's where that symbol comes from. And like I said, you find it in the catacombs. That's where we, we see the first instances of that particular symbol. Um, there's a chapter on Islam that talks about um, uh, Isaac and Ishmael. And there was some confusion on this, so I got some questions about this. Um, this is a fascinating thing, right? It's true history, right? Ancient history. Um, Abraham is the great, you know, patriarch of monotheism. From him, from Abraham, comes the, both the Jewish people and the Islamic people. And the Christians come from the Jewish people, right? So um, he is the father of that particular idea in the world that there is one God. Um, the story is, now the story is told two different ways, right? Depending on who you are descended from. The story in the Bible, in, in the Old Testament, which is the scriptures of the Jewish nation, is that um, God promised Abraham that he would have a son. And Abraham couldn't have kids. His wife was barren. Sarah, his wife, could not bear kids. And he had despaired of having a child. And in that day and age, that was a disaster, right? You, the way you passed on all that you had done and everything you had accomplished and all of your uh, possessions uh, was through your son. And Abraham didn't have a son. But God had promised that he would be the father of a great nation. Uh, and so he decided to help God out a bit. And Sarah, his wife, helped him. She kind of came up with this idea. She had a slave, uh, a servant named Hagar. And Sarah said, well, why don't you go into my maidservant, Hagar, and she will bear a son who will be your heir. And Abraham says, okay, he does this. Um, then Sarah gets pregnant and has Isaac. And so Isaac 
according to Jewish scriptures, is the child of the promise of God. And, and the, the Jewish people trace their heritage through Isaac. Um, Hagar became, you know, somebody they didn't want around, right? Think about uh, Sarah was, the story of Sarah just couldn't stand having her around because Sarah had a child, Isaac, and Hagar had a child, Ishmael was the name of Hagar's child, who could compete with um, Isaac for places, Abraham's son, Isaac, uh, um, Ishmael is the older of the sons of, of um, Abraham. And so Sarah makes Abraham send Hagar out of the camp, send her off into the wilderness. And in the Bible, like in the Jewish New Testament, um, oh, I'm sorry, the Jewish Old Testament, New Testament's the other part of the Bible, um, the way the story goes is that Hagar is out and she's and she's dying of thirst and, and hunger and exposure in the wilderness. And she sets the baby down, sets uh, um, Ishmael down, and and goes a little ways away because she doesn't want to see him die. And an angel appears and and gives and, and rescues her and, and Ishmael. And they survive. And God promises Ishmael that he will make a great nation out of him as well. And the Islamic people and the Arabic folks trace their genealogy through Ishmael. And the other thing it says in the, in the, in the uh, Old Testament is that there will be continual strife between the nation of Ishmael and the nation of Isaac. And that has happened down to this very day. Uh, the the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is just a the latest <laughs> installment of that particular conflict. It's been going on for 5,000 years or so. Um, and so that's that's why you get these two different stories. The Islamic people are looking through you know, their 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 link back to Abraham is through Ishmael, and for the Jewish people, their link back to Abraham is through Isaac. Um, so last thing, um, Arius or Nicaea? <laughs> Arius Arianism, not the Nazi Arianism, spelled differently. Aryan, the Aryan race uh, theory of the Nazis has nothing to do with the Aryan heresy, uh, which was the first great challenge to Christianity. Um, as Christianity began to grow and spread through the empire, and as it became more and more acceptable as a religion, a difference arose about the nature of God, um, a particularly uh, charismatic um, bishop named Arius um, had an idea about God that was different from what the apostles had taught and different from what most Christians amongst the poor folks believed. Um, you have to realize that, that, that Roman society, as most societies are, was highly stratified between your noble people and your high-class folks, your aristocrats, if you will, and your military leaders and your captains of, of, of forces. Um, and, and then the rabble, right? Everybody else. Um, the rabble believed that uh, God and Jesus were consubstantial. There's, a, there's a, a big word. Of the same substance. That Jesus is God. God is Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God and Jesus. Right? That's the Trinity. And it's, and, and it's expressed in, in that particular faith and the Catholic faith and a great many other uh, Protestant denominations as a mystery. Uh, it's just something we can't understand. How can God be three in one? Um, but that was what Christians believed, and that was what the early Christians believed. Um, Arius didn't feel like that was rational. It just didn't make sense. And so he put forward an idea that Jesus was created by God. Jesus wasn't God. He was just somebody very close to God. But he was a, a very um, exalted human being, but a human being nonetheless, created by God. Uh, and this idea took hold amongst the upper class of society in the Roman Empire. Um, and they really kind of looked down their noses at these crazy, um, you know, uneducated, rustic people who think absurd things like God is three in one. And and it was a it was one of the big big. Um, debates about what the nature of Christianity is. And the reason that um, 
Arianism didn't succeed, right, is that it, it radically changes uh, what Christianity does in the world. The, the Christian story is an outrageous story. It is an astonishing claim that God himself became a man, became like us, without giving up being God at the same time. And in doing so, that one statement, that one belief, God became man, um, elevates man, right? It, it, look, slavery died as an institution in the Roman Empire. It just died out. Uh, nobody, there was, there were no wars to free the slaves. There was no, there were a few slave rebellions early on and, and stuff. But, but as, as the Roman world collapsed and as the Middle Ages began, the slaves just gradually became serfs and then peasants. Um, Christian people just can't have slaves. It's just not part of Christian culture because once you said that God became a man and died the death of a criminal, there's nobody you can look down on anymore, right? You, you, have, you, still, have, you still have a stratification of society in the Middle Ages. You've got your nobility and your knights and you've got your peasants and serfs, but the knight and the, even the king is equal to the peasant in their relationship with God. There is no difference between the peasant and the king as they relate to their individual relationships with God. And that kind of culture, that kind of idea only becomes possible if you say, well, it only become, but it becomes very much possible, it becomes something that's going to happen if you start believing that God at some point became a man and died to redeem all of mankind. Of hu or humankind, right? It's still sexist language. We're growing and changing as we speak, right? We're, and that's one thing you can see, guys. One of the one of the hopeful things. I guess really easy for old stogie professors like me to say the world's going to hell in a handbasket, right? Everything's getting worse. There's one thing I see getting better, and that is this understanding of who has equal dignity as a human being. Um, less than a hundred years ago, women didn't have the right to vote. Now, it's outrageous that anyone would say, oh, you can't vote because you're a woman. Um, in the 1950s and early 60s, there were still laws forbidding black people to vote. And now those are all gone. They're annihilated. They're done away with. Um, no one who is, who is a decent human being is saying we shouldn't let black people vote. Um, and this is moving forward. Now we're becoming more aware of differences in gender and differences in sexuality and all kinds of things where we're, 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 we're admitting more and more different kinds of people to um, the status of human beings with equal dignity with everyone else um, that we're not. Very recently, we're not allowed to be in that, in that category. Um, we're watching this change before our very eyes. And for many people, it's very concerning, right? It's, it's an upsetting the, the order of things. But this is a process that's been going on since the very beginning of the Christian age. The, the elevation of the ordinary person, the saying that no one, there's no one, there's no human being, no life that isn't precious because God came down from heaven <laughs> to become a person. And not just a person, not a noble person, an ordinary person. Um, there's the, one of the prophetic passages in Isaiah said he had no beauty that we would look at him. There was nothing about him that would cause us to be attracted to him. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Uh, the idea that God could become that for us, right? that changes things. That alters the shape of what people think about other human beings. And that alteration is continuing to this very day. Um, Sorry I get this up so late, guys. Long day. Wiped out. Um, hopefully I was coherent. Um, I will throw another one of these up next Monday. Uh, keep plug plugging along, um, working on test two, and uh, get in touch with me if, um, if you need me. Um, I'm thinking about doing something, just FYI. Uh, maybe getting a whole bunch of donuts, like towards the last part of class and, and meeting in one of the classrooms on campus if we want to kind of say, hey, you know, I, I don't, it's, it's really odd for me. I don't, it, it makes me nervous to teach people I don't know who you are. I, I can't see your face. I would like to be able to put a face with some of the names that uh, I, I have in this class. Anyway, that's just a thought. I'm not sure I'm going to do it or not, but it's a thought. Let me know. 
send me court messages. Send me something in the course messages uh, if you think that would be a good idea. If you'd like to do that, and I will see you next Monday.